Gentlemen, today's guest is a best-selling author, a leadership expert. He's the host of the Great Man Podcast, as well as the Stephen Mansfield Podcast. He teaches us about leadership, about courage, and looks at current events and life in a way that is really admirable. He's written many books that are amazing, including Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, which is one of my favorites. Uh, we're going to talk to Stephen Mansfield today on the Manlyhood Mancast. In a culture that scoffs at honor, you can rise up to lead and to shine. It's time to be the best man that you can be. This is the Manlyhood Mancast. Here's your host, Josh Hatcher. Gentlemen, welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast. Please don't forget our Valentine's Day contest that we have right now going on. If you go to manlyhood.com slash contests, and you can sign up for this Valentine's Day contest where you're going to win uh, some amazing handmade jewelry from two of our amazing creator friends, which one of them is Haven Designed, which is my husband and his wife, and they make some handmade leather and wood things, and they're, they've made some beautiful earrings. Uh, for your lady that you can give her as a gift if you win this contest. And also our other creator friend, uh, Becca, she's got a place called Jawbone and Honey, and she's made some gorgeous, gorgeous earrings to be able to give, uh, again, to your spouse. And I'm also going to include in there a Visa gift card so that you can take your spouse out to dinner. Um, I want you to be able to win this so that you can look like a hero on Valentine's Day. So please go to manlyhood.com slash contests and sign up. Don't forget, we're still accepting signups for the Change Your Life in a Year coaching program. All you got to do is message me and I'll tell you all the details. And we've got more contests, more giveaways, more awesome stuff coming up for you soon. If you go to manlyhood.com, you can find out more. Gentlemen, today's guest, uh, I've been following this guy for a long time. I first discovered him through the book Mansfield Book of Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, which is awesome. I, I took a group of guys through the book together, and we learned a lot, and it really encouraged us. And I love uh, his podcast. If you go to the Great Man podcast or you check out the Stephen Mansfield podcast, both of them are amazing. He teaches a lot about leadership. He teaches a lot about how to be a better man. And I was honored that he got back to me to be on the on the podcast, and we had a great conversation. So without further ado, this is Stephen Mansfield. Stephen Mansfield, how are you today? I'm doing well. Good to talk to you, buddy. You too. It's great to have you on the show. You know, I had a men's group that met in a tattoo parlor several years ago. Yeah, we had a men's group. We read through the Stephen Mansfield's Book of Menly Men, and we had a great experience. That was awesome. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. I'm grateful. I'm glad, so glad. You probably had a little spike in your book sales that month. So, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't track that stuff, but I'm, but I, I'm glad for it. That's awesome. Uh, one of the stories that uh, you told in the book that I think was one of the most meaningful to us was the story when you're in the Middle East and you get a new name. Could you maybe talk us through that? Oh, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Uh, I was part of a group of people who were trying to help the Kurds in, in uh, Iraqi, the Iraqi Kurdistan, as they call it. And so back in the day before the Syrian civil war, we went through, uh, we flew into Damascus. Well, on this particular trip, although I'd made it many times before without any hassles, we'd, we'd fly in, then go across the Syrian desert, I got stuck. And so some of my friends who knew I'd been there for a couple of weeks, some of my Syrian friends, uh, decided to have a kind of a party for me on, on the roof of a hotel in Damascus. A beautiful night. And uh, it was kind of hard to communicate, kind of difficult to you know, go back and forth because of the language barrier. But finally, a man said, uh, Stephen, a son, do you have? And I said, I do. And they said, what is his name? And I said, Jonathan. And they said, well, then in Arab, you have a new name. And I said, what is that? They said, Abu John. Well, the backstory here is that it, the, being a father is such an honorary thing in Arab culture that they give the man a new name, Abu, which means father of, and then an abbreviated version of the son's name. So my name in, in that lore became Abu John. And at that moment, the partying began, shooting of Uzis in the air, uh, you know, great mountains of food, dancing, and it went on to about four in the morning. 
And so just to keep the story short, um, it really affected me. And I stayed up the rest of that night back at my hotel trying to figure out what it was I felt that was so different. Um, you know, I'd, I'd been, a, I mean, I was in my 30s at this time. My son had not just been born. He was maybe 10, 12 years old. Um, you know, so it was, it was, I was trying to figure out, it, and I realized it was the first time in all of my life, though I'd had a good life and grown up a military brat and what have you, it was the first time that anybody had welcomed me to any phase of manhood. And, it, and that's why it so profoundly impacted me. I mean, you know how it goes with typical American lives, you know, we, we go to high school, go to school and graduate and people give us gifts, but there's no discussion of being a man or what's the phase of manhood you're entering now. Same when you graduate high school, maybe the same when you go to call, uh, get married or have kids. No group of men takes you aside and, and celebrates you as a man and celebrates this new phase of manhood, maybe gives you some wisdom. So I was profoundly touched by that and came back to the States and really began to look at men in the country in a different through a different lens. You know, are we are we marking the phases of manhood? Are we calling men to be good men in every phase of their lives? Because there I was, uh, early 30s, and it was the first time I'd ever been uh, acknowledged in any way. It was a profound experience for me. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I love that story, and I think it's a powerful thing. Uh, you've got another book that I think is an amazing book, and it it's a really what I'd like to talk to you about today is building a band of brothers. Maybe we could talk about that. How does that work? Well, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of speaking around the world to men and I've uh, written a book, as you say, Mansfield's book of manly men. Uh, but still I noticed something missing in the lives of men. Uh, they, uh, men. Most of the men that I was speaking to, they wanted to be good men. They wanted to break from negative history in their family, perhaps. Uh, they, they wanted to be righteous men. They wanted to be noble men. They wanted to leave a legacy, all those good things. Um, but something was missing. It was, it, it, frankly, I felt like it had a lot to do with maybe the message, and I, I, I use sarcasm to describe this, so forgive me, but kind of the don't touch that um, school of manhood, meaning behave yourself, don't touch that. Uh, you keep stay within boundaries. Uh, don't do certain things, and that's that's what leads to noble manhood. Well, there's certainly in all ethical systems a don't do that kind of thing, right? Don't kill, don't beat people, don't you know? Obviously, um, but at the same time, being a man, being a good noble man, is not just about what you don't do. And and of course, when I say don't touch that, obviously I'm applying that mainly to the sexual messages that come to men. Don't touch that, and you'll be a good man. Well, that's not all there is. So um, I began to realize that men uh, were largely trying to do noble manhood alone. And it can't be done alone. It couldn't be done in my life. I've never known a man who really achieved any level of noble manhood who walked alone. Um, and I believe that men have got to have around them and build intentionally a band of brothers. And we can talk about what happens in our culture and why most men, most men don't have that. Um, but, but I don't believe that a man just trying to be good on his own is enough uh, for a variety of reasons we can talk about. And so I wrote this booklet, Building Your Band of Brothers, and it's, it's been pretty profound, the impact of it. I'm not bragging. It's just that men needed to hear this, and they needed to hear uh, maybe from my own life um, that I walked alone, relatively alone, until relatively late into my life or into the, in the middle of years without really having had a band of brothers. And so the, all of that, I think, has caused the book to have a bit of an impact. I think especially with that don't touch that message, like that's even hard to do <laughs> without that band of brothers. Like even that simplest code is hard to fulfill. Well, I mean, I'm going to be real graphic and, bl and blunt with you just for a moment. Forgive me. But if all a man does is not masturbate or not look at porn or uh, not cuss or not be short with his wife, is he a great man? Well, he may have taken 10 or 20 percent of the step towards being a good man and doing those things, but that ain't all of it. <laughs> I mean, that's right. all of it, right? That's not, And by the way, I don't touch that approach to noble manhood. It's going to frankly bore most men. Okay, I got to skip my little boundaries and be good and behave myself and wear my little tie and my little coat on Sunday, you know, that kind of vibe. Um, and I'm not saying that that's not valuable. I believe in moral and ethical codes. We all should. Um, whatever our faith, but I will say um, that really uh, men can't fulfill the best they're made to be unless they've got a band of men around them 
um, with whom they have what I call the free fire zone. We can talk about that further if you want to, uh, where they really are uh, invested in each other's lives, doing life together and helping each other be better men. And so I want to blow past the don't touch that school of thought. Uh, I would certainly want to build on an ethical system, but I want men to live passionately, full-on masculine lives in league with other men. And that's what a band of brothers allows a man to do. Yeah. What exactly is that free fire zone? How does that work? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, those who have served in the military who are listening to your program uh, will know the free fire zone is a certain condition of how freely a soldier can fire on the battlefield. Uh, and so they, will have heard, they would have heard that phrase in that context. But for me, a free fire zone is what you want to achieve with a band of brothers. A free fire zone means that anything that needs to be said or addressed in anyone's life in that group will be with an attempt, uh, with, an, with the purpose of helping and improving that man. You know how it goes. Uh, we've all been standing there. Uh, a guy we all know named Bob is, is in decline. He's drinking too much. Or his marriage has fallen apart or he's gained 50 pounds or whatever. And everybody's wringing their hands. I hope somebody talks to Bob. Who's going to talk to Bob? I don't know him that well. He's really your friend, not mine. And, you know, and, and there's, there's that kind of human response. And then there's the cultural response. In the South, we're all, well, I would never hurt his feelings. And up North, we're all supposed to be cold-hearted Yankees. And out West, we're all supposed to be the individual marble man. And nobody goes and talks to Bob. Well, a free fire zone amongst a band of brothers says this. Here's, it's basically, I'll say it as though it's me saying it. Anything that needs to be addressed in my life, anything you see, anything that needs to be spoken to, I'm asking you to speak to it. I'm asking you to coach me. I'm asking you to help me be a better man. And I'm not convinced that the average man, certainly I couldn't, become a, a better man or approach the man I'm made to be without the eyes of other men on me. Uh, we've got to have people who see us in 3D view. And so, I, you know, what goes on in a lot of our culture is that you have sort of accountability groups or small groups, and I'm all for them. But, but if the assumption is that I'm going to figure out what's wrong with me, wait three weeks until the breakfast fest is happening, drive across town, go to the restaurant and tell you guys in my group what's wrong with me so you can give me advice and maybe pray for me, I'm going to tell you I'm going to be in trouble. I need guys who see my life without me having to narrate it for them. What's going on with Stephen? What's his attitude? Is he taking a fourth look at the backside of the waitress? Is he on not one glass of wine or two, but 10 a night? Is he, has he gained 50 pounds? Is he dropping the F-bomb every 16 minutes? Did he just have that angry cell phone call with his wife? You see what I mean? Um, those may, none of those may be issues for me. I'm just saying that we want men to be able to see us without us narrating for them. Because quite frankly, most men will lie. <laughs> you know, We'll hide stuff, right? We're good at that. I need men who know me without me having to describe it for them and who will confront me, talk to me, coach me, love me anyway, and then we'll go sacrifice some animals and have fun and play racquetball or whatever it is we do. And so men need that. You can't walk alone. And the trajectory of our average American life is towards isolation. We have good friendships in high school and college and maybe the military and early career. But as we get married, we have a house and we got kids and we got jobs and we got responsibilities and a yard, a dog, we just start to isolate. And so I'll close this off by saying the psychologists call the friends we tend to have rust friends. Rust friends, are that's the guy who was in your wedding that maybe you've had one phone call with in the last five years. And sometimes when I uh, ask men if they're walking closely with men or have good men in their lives, they'll say, well, there was this guy at my wedding uh, when I got married 10 years ago. I, I talked to him about every year. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not a band of brothers. I'm thrilled that guy's your buddy, but he doesn't have eyes on you. You don't have eyes on him. You're not helping each other. And that's what a band of brothers does. We need that connection and that relationship to be able to receive. You know, I if someone comes up to me and just tells me the thing that they think I need to hear, I'm not even going to receive it. Well, in, in addition, Josh, you want to receive that. You don't. I mean, I don't give permission to everybody in the world to address anything about me. I mean, come on, we have some privacy, we have some pride, uh, and I don't trust just anybody about these things. Um, but if you and I have been in a band of brothers for 10 years, trust me, you've got the right to address anything in my life 
that needs to be addressed. You see something in my marriage or my parenting or my body or the way I conducted myself, in my case, on stage. I've even had guys confront me on stuff I started to say in a book, and then I had to change the draft, you know, because I said something about somebody that probably was a little bit rude. And so I was glad that my, some of my guys, not all of them, you know, saw the, saw what I'd written. Um, so you you got to have a band of brothers you entrust that to. I don't entrust it to everybody. Not everybody, when I fly on an airplane, has the right to speak to me about what's wrong in my life. But if I've been walking with you for five years in my band of brothers, you do. And that's what we trust. That's what we need. Um, uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a man who is defined by himself is defined by a fool. Uh, he's got to have other men speaking into, their, into his life. In my online men's group that we have, I've had the question a lot. How do we do this? Like, I don't even know how to make friends anymore. Yeah. It's a skill that's not been passed down from the gen- through the generations. It's a skill that fathers have not taught. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, let me just cut to the chase and tell you that one of the good things about men is that it is something I'll call the indirect connection. Okay, let me describe it real quick. Men don't bond the best when they're looking each other in their eyes and talking about their emotions. But they don't. Men bond best when they're doing other things than bonding. That's why when you talk to guys who fought in wars uh, and they feel so close to guys who were in the foxholes with them, they didn't, they, they didn't go to war to bond with other men. <laughs> Barely had time to get their pants on. Um, but they bonded with those men because they were doing other things. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been part of a church, you know, for most of my adult life. And, and, um, and I remember that sometimes the times we would bond was when we were fixing somebody's house after a flood or helping that widow with her yard or helping the, the, uh, the kids of single moms and stuff like that. And we didn't go in there to bond, but by the time that day was over, I had bonded with those men because we were doing something else. They do studies where they put little girls and little boys into rooms and then they observe them. They got toys and stuff. The little girls inevitably turn chairs towards each other, look each other full in the face. One of the little girls will say, I like your hair. And they're best friends forever, right? They just bond. Women have that ability. They have that gift, that skill. Little boys, though, don't really talk about the relationship. What they do is turn the chairs side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and start thinking of things to do. That I can get, we can get Tommy to pull us in that wagon that I can beat you to that tree, that we can set that door on fire or whatever's in their little brains. But they become buddies by doing indirect things, other things. And so the good news is for the shyest guy listening to this program, um, he, any, any, even the shyest guy can order up some pizza during a football game. Even the shyest guy can cook some burgers after a basketball game. You know what I'm saying? Even the shyest guy, I'm thinking of my context in Nashville, can, do, can form a drum circle or put together a bunch of guys with guitars or, or just, I don't know, watch a, watch a movie. Um, so you create the indirect connection. And that's the answer for the guys who are going, I don't even know how to make friends. Well, don't get too direct about making friends. Instead, uh, create some indirect way for guys to connect. And then, you know, as, as that gets a little bit warm and solid and safe, start asking guys, well, you know, what did your father teach you about manhood? Or I've been reading this book. It's really challenging me. Have you read it? He's got some ideas I wanted to bring up to you guys and see what you thought. Just indirectly, just without, you know, don't take, don't take hostages. Uh, you know, don't go after people too directly. Um, just start bringing up things to discuss. And once you create that indirect connection, guys, guys will fall in because every man's wondering about the same things himself. Yeah, it takes time, too. It's not something that happens instantly. And I think people want everything like a microwave burrito. Well, yeah, we want everything to be snap, crackle, pop. I mean, just instant. Um, but I, I know guys who say, look, if I feed a man, have it in my home and have some fun and shoot some hoops and hit the pool um, for about six months, we're going to be friends. Now, whether that's going to turn towards him being in my band of brothers or whether that, and whether we're going to go deep, that, that's a matter of what his soul, the condition of his soul and how willing he is. But we will be friends because men bond by doing things indirectly. And so that's the good news for guys, even like I say, the shyest guy, the loneliest guy listening to us right now. He can just invite the many knows to some kind of gathering. Heck, Monday night football with some pizza is all it takes, you know, or whatever it is you're interested in. But then you start turning it towards, we, in our group, we call it the 3B because of the building your band of brothers, 3Bs in the title. So turn the conversation towards 3B themes kind of thing. But anyway, the point is, you've got to walk with other men. And I'm going to give a dire warning here. 
Um, the male suicide rate is sky high. In England, it's absolutely off the charts for men over 50. And when we do the psychological postmortems on those suicides, in almost every case, the suicide note, the last recording, the last thing said to someone was about there not being other men who were in that man's life. Not a man knows I'm alive. Not another man cares. My father died. My brother is on the other side of the world. I don't have any men in my life. And that's the last thing the guy says before he kills himself. And I'm not being casual about that with the male suicide rate so high. We may have people listening now who are pondering that. But the point is, it's about loneliness. It's about isolation. It's about not having a band of brothers. I think our culture has reinforced the idea that isolation is a good thing. And in the past few years, there's just been more of it. And it's not healthy. No. No, uh, nobody's meant to walk alone, not men, not women, not children. Uh, they're not meant to walk alone. We're meant to be in community. Um, but, the, but the bottom line is that men get talked out of it. We get talked out of it because of sort of Marlboro man, go it alone, you know, strong, uh, lonely type, you know, guy going out in the wilderness kind of image. And we get talked out of it just by virtue of the pressure of our lives. And that's why I talk to men about it. They have to be intentional about it. Uh, the responsibilities of home, the responsibility of job, the responsibilities of marriage and fatherhood, all of which are joys, by the way. But those things happen naturally. You get up in the morning, they're staring you in the face. But the responsibility of nurturing your, ma nurturing your masculine soul, uh, the responsibility of having other men's eyes on you. You know, I tell women all the time when I'm talking to them in groups, maybe paralleling some of the men's groups that I do, um, you know what, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to make sure your husband's in a band of brothers. And the, and the good men are speaking into his life. You'll be a happier woman. You'll have a better husband. You'll, be a, you'll have a, a better father. You'll have a better provider. And all the things you're looking for uh, from a husband, you'll have a better lover, everything, you know. Uh, men will ask each other about that stuff. How are you being romantically? Man, you need to shed 30 pounds. Man, when was the last time you took her out for a date? You know, what was that angry conversation I heard the other day? So uh, the ability, everything improves when a man walks with a meaningful band of brothers. Yeah. And this excellent insights. So I like to ask all my guests a few questions. The first one is, Stephen, what does it take to be a man? Well, I'll tell you honestly, I'm a Christian, and so I believe that God made us all, uh, designed us all, and that a lot of being a man is figuring out what it is that God designed men to be. In Scripture, the, the, the believing Scripture is a pattern for us. Um, scripture often talks about the, the lore of manhood or the ways of a man. And those aren't often transmitted from generation to generation. So a man's got to reclaim what his design is, what his purpose was, as they say today, what his power is, and use it for noble purposes. Uh, I believe that's the heart of manhood. What were you made for? How do you nurture that in your own life? How do you keep that alive? Um, how do you grow it? And how do you use it for noble good? And that's, that's, I think, when men really come alive and really begin to fulfill their purpose and feel the joy and the power of what it means to be a man. Yeah. I think that's definitely the, it, you know, you look at a tool and then you read the owner's manual to find out how to use it, right? <laughs> exactly. And, that, and, you know, by the way, it's not all duty. It's not all about, you know, okay, a good man mows the yard, a good man, you know, goes on date night. It's also about what do you need to stay afire? What do you need to be aflame? What do you need to be... Uh, fully passionate and fully alive as a man. You know, we've all heard the illustration time and again that when you get on the airplane, they tell you to put those oxygen masks on yourself first before you help whoever you're responsible for because if you pass out, that person's going to die, especially if it's a child. So take care of yourself first, not in a vain way. Make sure you're thriving. Make sure you're healthy. Make sure you're getting up in the morning and working out. Make sure you're on top of the whatever addictions are nibbling at the edge of your life or whatever. Uh, make sure you are reading the right books. Understand what manhood is. Make sure you've got man speaking, men speaking into your life and coaching you and helping you be a better. And then, yeah, you use that power of noble manhood for the good of your family, for the good of society, for the good of the, you know, the causes you're committed to. So, yeah, I, I think it's all about discovering God's design and then walking it out with power. Awesome. Stephen, let's assume for a minute that we can suspend the laws of time and space and you can have a conversation with 10-year-old you. What do you want to tell him? Well, I'll tell you, in my life, uh, though you might, not, you might not be able to tell it now, 
the most debilitating thing until I went to college and had some transformations happen uh, for me was insecurity. Uh, my father loved me very much, but he was a very commanding figure, a military hero, uh, very commanding figure. I lived in a military context. It was all about performance. Uh, it was all about what the general would think if he drove by the house and the yard, yard wasn't mowed. You know, that kind of what will they think. And it produced in me, nobody's fault, but it produced in me a great insecurity. Um, and at the age of 10, that was really beginning to take root in my soul. What do they think? Do I measure up? Um, you know, feeling insecure, uh, feeling unsure of myself. And I look back at my first, let's say, 18 years of life. There are a lot of things I didn't do, a lot of things I didn't invest in. Uh, girls I didn't ask out, teams I didn't get try to get on, uh, trips I didn't take, uh, things I didn't step up into. Uh, your student government offices I didn't run for that I think would have made me a better guy and let me both do good in the world but also use my gifts. But I was just debilitatingly insecure. Now, most of my friends right now say, well, God overcorrected in your case. You're not insecure at all. Um, but I am. All people are insecure. Um, but at that time, at 10 years old, I was stunningly insecure. So if I could go back and talk to Stephen Mansfield at 10, I would try to unravel that a little bit for him. Uh, you know, your father's not trying to make you weak. He's trying to make you stronger and, and uh, just, just, just strike out and, and, and be bold. And fortune favors the bold, I would have said to him. And, and uh, you've allowed some, some hurts, some wounds, some punishments to uh, get deep in your soul and make you think that you're not, not, not able or capable or, or shouldn't, shouldn't try big things, that you should just stay within your little boundaries and, and not pop your head up a little bit. And uh, I think that, that harmed me. I, I eventually got over that later with help. Uh, but I think at 10 years old, I lost maybe a decade of, of opportunity to really thrive. Stephen, what is your best advice for the men listening today? It's what we've been talking about this whole program. Get other men in your life. Uh, quickly, I once saw a picture of myself from, uh, taken at a party. It was the ugliest picture of a human being I've ever seen. I, I, I won't even describe it, but it was of me. And, and I, I, when I looked at it, I thought, who in the world is that? I couldn't even recognize myself. And later, uh, after I realized it was me, I thought to myself, if I can look like that physically um, without realizing that that's even possible, what's going on on the inside of me that I don't notice? What is it I can't see clearly about myself? you got to have other men in your life to be your best, other men who are committed to noble manhood, who are committed to you, you're committed to them. Anything can be said that needs to be said, anything addressed while you're having fun and eating a lot along the way. And so build that free fire zone with good men. That's the best advice I know other than uh, realize that God is the author of manhood and ask him into your life so that you can um, truly take hold of the godly design for your life. That is excellent advice, and I will agree 100% with it. So thank you. Fantastic. So. Stephen, what's the best way for our guys to get in touch with you and connect with your work? Great. If you want to know about me, it's stephenmansfield.tv. Just go there and you'll learn all about podcasts, other things that we do. And in my our work for men, everything is greatman.tv. The website's greatman.tv. The Twitter feed is greatman TV, not with a dot, but TV. Uh, but you can you can check into all of that. It's Stephen, spelled with a PH, the only way that ought to be legal, stephenmansfield.tv. Awesome. Well, I appreciate so much uh, you having this conversation with us. I know you're a busy man, and so I definitely appreciate that you take the time to talk to us today, man. Josh, it's a privilege, man. God bless you. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate all of this. This is amazing. And if you want to connect with the work that Stephen Mansfield is doing, make sure you check out the links in the show notes. Uh, we've got links to his books, to his podcasts. Let's, let's show him some support because not only are we supporting his mission of helping men, but we're going to be better men because of it. So let's make sure we connect with him and check out the work he's doing. Guys, I just wanted you to know that I appreciate you. I know that you are working hard at becoming a better man. And if there's anything I can do to help support you in that, I want to do that. Make sure you join our private Facebook group, uh, the Manlyhood Man Cave on Facebook, because that's a group where men are connecting and growing and learning and encouraging each other. And it's a great place for us to be able to do that. So reach out to us there. I'd love to have you. Listen, guys, I love you. I care about you. And I'll see you next time. 
you want to be a better man, check out our website, manlyhood.com, for blogs, videos, and more from our Manlyhood team. Men, you can also join our private Facebook group, Manlyhood Man Cave, where you can meet up with a band of brothers who will challenge you and help you on your journey of manhood. This episode is produced by Hatcher Media for Manlyhood.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to the show. Tune in again for more of the Manlyhood Mancast.